hit me. From Studio P in Sausalito, the home of the hit, it's time for... Suckatash. Yes, Suckatash, the comedy soundcast, soundcast featuring snippets from comedy... Soundcasts. And also interviews with comedians, comedian soundcasters, and other showbiz folk. And now, here's your host, internationally recognized comedy soundcast, soundcaster, Mark... Hershon. Welcome, Mark Hershon here, your every other weekly host for Suckatash, the comedy soundcast soundcast. This is episode 270 of the show that knows how. Knows how to play clips of comedy soundcasts anyway. A sort of Whitman sampler of audio treats, if you will, that gives you the chance to slip in a taste of various soundcasts into your ear holes, take a nibble, and see if you don't want to go find the whole show and pig out listening wise. I had a week off from a day job for vacation last week. Tyson Saner was manning the uh, the big chair for the, the soundcast, so I headed down to Los Angeles for some R&R. I got a chance to hang out with some pals and chums I hadn't seen for a while, a few of them having been past visitors to this here show, including Travis Clark, Francis Cronin, John Manfrelotti, Rick Overton, and Dana Carvey. It was a lot of fun. I got a whole lot of nothing done, and I feel rested up and ready to clip. Last week in this feed for Epi 269, my classy, crafty, and cogent co-host Tyson Saner not only served up some crispy clips from the soundcasts Gluten-Free Gaming, The Spawn Chunks, and Coffee with Butterscotch, but he also shared a big chunk of an interview with the very funny Andy Kindler that he conducted over on his other soundcast, Antisocial Show, along with his co-host there, Hunter Block. It's all seeming a little incestuous. If you missed it somehow, check out any of the usual Soundcast distribution points like Spotify, Apple and Google Podcasts, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Audible.com, and more. Or just visit our home site, SuckatashShow.com, where you can find every damn episode of Suckatash dating back 10 years to when we started. Which leads me to what I have in store for your auditory senses today. I have clips from the Ajuma Show, Ghetto Boys Reloaded, and Household Faces. In addition, I came across this funny musical clip that comedian, actor, and perhaps future guest on this show, Patton Oswald, found by Nick Lutzko, uh, who took a bunch of wackadoodle rants by ultra-right-wing nutball Alex Jones and turned them into a folk song. And we have a couple of calls on the Succotash Not So Hotline, including a new runaway truck ramp report that came in over the weekend from me. Yes, me, recorded as I was driving north on Interstate 5 on my way home through that stretch of road commonly called the Grapevine. And, of course, we're sponsored by Henderson's Pants and their new Toddler Trowel. But before I get into this episode, I have to admit that I'm a little late recording this installment and posting it, but it's given me the chance to get a word in here about the passing of great comedian Norm MacDonald. He was secretly battling cancer for nine years and lost that fight this week. He was one prominent comedian on the scene that I never got to meet personally, but we have a lot of mutual friends in common, and everyone has told me over the years what a great, crazy, funny guy Norm was. Jermaine, to our show, he hosted an audio and video soundcast, Norm MacDonald Live, from 2013 to 2016, where he interviewed guests, mostly friends from the comedy and acting world. Here's a clip I featured back in Succotash Epi 89, two comedy greats that we will never get to hear or see perform live again, Norm MacDonald chatting with Carl Reiner on his show. Our guest tonight for the full hour, Hollywood legend Carl Reiner won nine Emmys and one Grammy my, Award. My mo- mother would be so upset because I won 12, and she always used to get upset. Somebody wrote nine, and she used to argue with the people in the park. and said, you know, won 12. <laughs> he has won a dozen Emmy Awards <laughs> during his career as a stand-up actor, director, producer, and writer. Worked on Sid Caesar's Your Show of Shows, also the Steve Allen Show, the Dick Van Dyke Show. Directed and co-wrote The Jerk and Dead Men Don't Wear Plaid. Played Saul Bloom in Oceans 11, 12, and 13. His books, I Remember Me, and I Just Remembered, they're on Amazon. It winded me that... that uh, <laughs> you did very well. Thank you. That's more work than I've ever done, and it's just what you've done. So, uh, <laughs> By the way, yes. when somebody asked me about you, I said, I always remember you as the man with the perfect perpetual smile. 
You are a smiling person, and it's true. That's not good for comedy, is it? No, it's wonderful. It is? wonderful, yeah. Because I'm here to have fun. I'm happy. And, you know, people go, comedians are miserable. I know. Are you? Were you miserable? Did that come from a place of misery? I'm a happy comedian. Yeah. What about you? Oh, you're not a comedian, right? No. I'm pretty miserable. (laughs) He is a, uh, he's a filthy bum. Oh. (laughs) Now, you know what he is? He's a comedy manager at the world famous comedy store. Oh, re- oh yeah. more people were discovered at that comedy store. Now yeah. they have the world famous comedy store. They have comedy clubs everywhere. Whew. But uh, now a person can go into comedy as a life choice, a career, a business. Right. When you started, such was not the case, I I measured. Well, I didn't start in comedy. I started as an actor. actor. Uh-huh. No, I was 17 years old, and my, my, this is interesting. My brother found a little ad in the New York Daily News, uh, free acting classes for would-be actors, the WPA, Works Progress yeah. Industry. You know, they say, get the government off the people's backs. No, yeah. that's where the people belong. But when they need help, huh. the government wants Fred, Franklin Roosevelt gave us help. Artists learn to paint. And not learned to paint, but made money painting the murals on on the post offices. Yeah. Musicians became musicians, and I went to an acting school where I I was 17 years old, and it's 100 Center Street in New York. I remember because I got married in the same place years uh-huh. later. But there was Mrs. Whitmore, an old English actress, who gave us acting lessons for uh-huh. free. Post the W pay the government paid for it. Yeah, the yeah. NYA Radio Workshop. Also government sponsored. I learned to twenty two dollars a month they gave us as a salary to do radio shows. Now how did your uh, parents respond to such a oh, my, wild idea? My parents were all for it. Really? They, oh, they were wow. so proud of they this lo- what year was this? Nineteen thirty nine. Nineteen thirty nine. Uh, war you know, about to break out in Europe. Yes. You know, it's funny when I mentioned Mrs. Uh, Whitmore, you're an old English actress. Yeah. I'll never forget the first day there. She said, we're going to learn a soliloquy from Hamlet, but we're not going to do the regular soliloquies. We want everyone in the class to learn Queen Gertrude's speech at the death of Ophelia. And uh, boys and girls will learn uh-huh. that. You can wake me up in the middle of the night. There is a willow grows a slant to brook that shows his hall leaves in the glassy stream. There with fantastic garlands that she come with crow flowers, nettles, daisies, and long purples that liberal shepherds give a grosser name. But our cold maids do dead men's fingers call them. There upon the cotton at clambering to hang, an envious sliver broke. When down her weedy trophies in herself fell into the weeping brook, her clothes spread wide and mermaid-like, at which time she chanted snatches of old tunes as one incapable of her own distress. But then the poor wretch was pulled from a melodious lay to muddy death. Now look at that. Oh, my goodness. No, I'm not kidding. And I haven't said that. Wow. In, in days. No. <laughs> <laughs> it makes me want to wake you up tonight. <laughs> That's a snippet from around 2014, I'm pretty sure. Norm MacDonald with Carl Reiner. Norm MacDonald dead at the age of 61 this week. Deep breath. Let's carry on. Our first clip comes from the Ajuma Show, featuring a pair of queer, their words, not mine, Chicago comedians, Peter Kim and Yuji Kim. Peter actually started out as a San Francisco improviser and took classes from me at the San Francisco Comedy College before helping to found the End Games Improv Company. He then went on to Chicago and uh, worked at Second City for a while, and uh, now he's uh, he's kind of off on his own. He's been in L.A. actually doing uh, some acting work, but still working uh, with his Chicago friend uh, doing the Ajuma Show. It's a weekly soundcast featuring... Uh, Love, politics, culture, personal victories, failures, and sage advice through the judgmental glare of an ajuma. What's an ajuma? It's a Korean word for a married or middle-aged woman, which seems a little judgy itself. I get the feeling it's someone who enjoys throwing shade on pretty much anything she doesn't like. In this clip, the Kims who are not related, chat about racially specific activities. You know, yeah. like, because also I'm very self-centered. So, like, even though kids at my, uh, in my high school were, like, going to Vail and Aspen, it never yeah. occurred to me that I would. I was just like, that's just white people shit. 
it is. I mean, it is. It is. But for it, it, lack it, of a better term, but it I, is. But like, because there were so many other immigrants there, it wasn't like we all right. just you know went to the park. The people who look like you did the stuff you did. Yeah, so it never felt and like the white weird. kids went to Vail. Yeah, yeah. And then and like, yeah. you know, like whatever. It's like that's their existence, and we went to the park with the cooler. Like you know, that was that. It didn't. <laughs> yeah. Oh I my didn't, god, <laughs> the park. <laughs> <laughs> The barbecues, yeah, the yahe, the yes. kue yahe, yes, right. you know what I mean. Yeah. And then the pastor's like giving the sermon outside. Everyone's like, "Can we just go throwing balloons? Like, we just want to get to the games." Games, yes. Pastor saw, let us play. You don't want your fucking sermon out, and there's you know like another like Mexican family having a birthday party next door. Like, come we on, can, we can see the subak. It is yeah. sweating. Please let us get to the subak. <laughs> the tangmyeon, the, the, the uh, what's it called? Um, uh, oh, japchae. Yeah. You know, like, japchae is the easiest, cheapest thing to make. So people, everyone during the kyoe yaes yeah. would all bring japchae. So we would have overloaded japchae on so the table. So much japchae. I couldn't eat japchae for, And there'd for be, like, years. one plate of LA Kaibi yes. from, like, the rich family that brought it. And we're all like, okay, we all get, like, one bar. One bar. bar. <laughs> <laughs> Not even a complete bar to yourself, you know? Yeah. Like, the third, the section that you cut off. You have to call. You have to call the bill. Like you. Know, like, yeah. <laughs> Someone has to eat the. And you better suck that tendon right yes, off, bitch. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but like that's. I mean, like it's I never. Labor. Thought, yeah, it's but I like we. But I never thought about less of myself. I never thought that at all. Like because I even that's, in contrast. That's good. Yeah. That's th- because you're, college, you weren't the only college. like yeah. poor Asian girl around mm-hmm. white kids. You know yeah. what I mean? Like. We grew up around immigrants, so we had a community of suffering. Yeah. So we all we all kind of looked at each other like, Ugh, yeah. you know, like, I go, and just like, <laughs> and the whole like getting together and creating your little poor community together. Yeah. That That's how we lived. But there are a lot of Koreans. They're very Korean rich American now. Ad- adoptees. Yeah. Very rich now. But like those who are like, I don't know, whose dad was a professor or something like that like something yeah but they didn't fancy. live in my they didn't live in my i mean they went to my church but they didn't live in my neighborhood they didn't go to my high school you that's know? He, yeah they weren't your socioeconomic no 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 they, they were lived in Northbrook. Off, but, yeah but they, they were like the else. they were the poorest out of their group sure you know so yeah. like they kind of had it a little worse almost because they're like we're richer than these other fucking koreans but all, all our neighbors yes. are Jewish and white. Yes. And we can't even compete with them. But that's the thing. I actually felt, I feel like that is worse. I feel bad for them. Yeah, that's yes, actually right? worse. Because they Cause felt we didn't it have to compete with the whites. Yes, I did not. I mean, it was yeah. just more like, oh, yeah. And also, because my parents were tailors, like, they could always take everything from Old Navy and make it look like it from the limited two. You know, like, it Well, could... there you go. <laughs> it's all about the fit. <laughs> <laughs> like I know, I never felt that, and it was like I actually felt more because I remember do, t- playing tennis with this girl from Deerfield, and she was like that, and it, and she felt that, oh. and she and you know, she, but she was still driving a tennis Lexus. in Deerfield sounds so like upper crust. Yeah, and it was my mom like it was like crazy like we had to do Mr. So like oh, like let me play and like for free for sometimes, and he would like mm-hmm. I just I'll never forget like the way that he would smoke and like come. I mean, he was he was like a, a, a um, loomed large in the Korean American community because of this tennis thing, but like yeah, he gave my parents a discounted rate. Like you know, he wanted mm-hmm. to have Korean kids mm-hmm. play tennis. It was like a thing with him, you know. But yeah. like I yeah. remember like her driving that like older Lexus and like drive, and it was just like she just looked lonely. I mean, she was a Korean girl with huge breasts, and I remember her being sad. I was just like, what could be wrong with your life? <laughs> what could be wrong with your life? You can check out The Ajuma Show as both an audio podcast and also as a video thing on YouTube every week. Just search for The Ajuma Show. That's spelled A-J-U-M-M-A. And put that right into your favorite internet browser. Now, I'm not exactly what you'd call a hip-hop guy. Hip, maybe, but hip-hop? Uh, I know. Hard to believe, but this next clip comes from a show that isn't exactly comedy. But when I saw that comedian Mike Epps was visiting hip hop legends Scarface and Willie D on their Ghetto Boys Reloaded soundcast, I figured it would be an excuse to bring a little culture into the room here. These guys tend to get a little deep, which is okay with me, as they converse about music, entertainment, social issues, and awareness, uh, among many other topics. In our clip, the hosts and Mike get into their guest story of leaving home for the first time and moving to Atlanta to start a career that turned out to be in comedy. I had an imagination. 
And I tell kids all the time, if mm. you don't have an imagination, you can't dream. You can't, you mm-hmm. can't, you got to be able to see some shit. Mm. Pre, 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 pre everything okay. before everybody. It's got to be in you. And I had an imagination of me being something. You know what I mean? I couldn't figure out what it was. So when I found out it was comedy, I was like, man, I'm on to something. Because I grew up watching kingpins and drug dealers. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, damn, man, I didn't try to sell dope and everything. I cannot become a kingpin for nothing in the world. Like, mm-hmm. it, I'm serious. I was the worst drug dealer in the world. I had everybody in that, all the OG niggas. The only reason why they ain't kill me is because they like me. Mm-hmm. Niggas used to tell me all the time, boy, you better be glad I like you. You know what I mean? Because, mm-hmm. nigga, you done ran off with my money. I had a gambling habit, and I was selling <laughs> dope. I was hustling backwards. <laughs> you know what I mean? I done shot dice with these niggas and lost my money, the, the front man's money. So by the time I left Indianapolis, man, I owed a couple niggas money and all kind of shit. I said, I got to go make it at something. You know, I got on a bus in 1991 with... My sister uh, gave me a eighty-five dollars book of food stamps. Damn! You remember them food stamps that was in the book? Yeah, mm-hmm. motherfuckers had the With green, the, bell on the it. blue the fives, and the, the green. Bell. Had the bell on it. Had the bell yeah. on it. Yeah, man. she bell. gave me some food stamps, and I had eighty-five dollars in a. a, a and I bought me a plan. I bought me a bus ticket, and my my first baby mama, her aunt, lived in Atlanta, and I called her. I said, Janet, you know, every time you come to Indianapolis, you say. You know, if you ever want to move to Atlanta, come to Atlanta. Man, I called her. I said, I want, I'm want. i ready to come to Atlanta. She said, Mike, some things didn't change. I said, oh, what? She shit. said, I'm married now. Oh, and, Lord. And, you know, I don't live by myself. Do you know that I told her okay and I still got on the bus? I got on that Greyhound bus. And by the time I got to Chattanooga, Tennessee, at the Greyhound, them niggas that took my car. I, I swear I'll never forget I had cross-color jeans and major damage. You remember cross cut mm-hmm. all the cut? Man, I had yeah. all this gear in my bag. By the time I got to Chattanooga, them niggas that took my... Oh, look at that. I said it. I said the word. You said the word? <laughs> yep. I Go said ahead, it. man. But I forgot we ain't on the corner. But uh, I, I said, they had took my bag. Man, when I got... And I had... I ain't gonna lie. I had a 38 that was broke. It was fucked up. And it, it skipped. And motherfucker shot like it. Click, click. Pow! Click, 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 pow! It was the pin, the pin was skipping on the, on the mother. By the time I got, and I had a walk, by the time I got to Georgia, I called her. It was 3 o'clock in the morning. I said, Janet, I'm in Atlanta. And she said, what? You bullshit. I said, I'm in Atlanta. She said, where you at? I said, I'm at the Greyhound bus station. She said, Mike, I told you I'm married. I can't handle, you know. I said, Janet, I'm going to stay in a Greyhound bus station. But when, when you get up in the morning, if you come and pick me up and take me to the Salvation Army, I can stay in the Salvation Army. I get a cot. That's how serious I was about being somebody and changing my life. Mm. She said, I'll be there in the morning. She came, pick me up. We riding. I had never been out of my hometown other than going to the joint on like in the outside Westville, stuff mm-hmm. like that. When I seen Atlanta and seen all them buildings, I said, damn, you know, it was crazy to see that. It was like a city to me. Because I had never seen a city like that other than Chicago. That's a lie. I've been, been to Chicago a million times, but I was in Atlanta. Atlanta was, mm-hmm. I thought Atlanta was Hollywood back in the day. Mm. When it freak Nick and them stuff, like, people mm-hmm. was moving to Atlanta like they was going down there to blow up. Mm-hmm. I moved to Atlanta instead of going to New York or L.A. Man, I seen this city, man, and we was riding, and she said, you know what? I can't take you down there. She said, you can come and stay with me, but you got to stay in the basement. My husband go to work. He works second shift, 3 to 11. You can't come out of the basement till after 3. That's the Ghetto Boys Reloaded. Check them wherever you stream or download your favorite soundcasts. I just reviewed the show our next clip is from, Household Faces, for Vulture.com's This Week in Comedy podcasts last week. Obviously, Vulture hasn't gotten the memo on calling them soundcasts, but I'm going to give them a pass because they pay me to do reviews. Hosted by character actor and improv comedian John Ross Bowie, he interviews other character actors, those men and women with familiar faces that I am always pointing out to my wife when we're watching TV or movies and shouting, I know that guy! John got pretty well known from his appearances on The Big Bang Theory, and he recently spent three seasons as the dad on Speechless on ABC. 
The clip I grabbed is from the episode I reviewed featuring Xander Berkeley. Now, you may be saying, I don't know from Xander Berkeley, but you, sir or madam, would be wrong. This guy's been in over 200 movies and TV shows, including 24, The Walking Dead, and as they get to in here, Terminator 2. I don't want to keep you too much longer, but uh, I'm looking at your your career and, and doing my my the Xander Berkeley Festival we've been running in this house over the past couple of weeks, which has been delightful. Do you have a favorite death scene, Xander? Because you've died on screen a lot. Well, this is the year that is the 20th anniversary of, of 24, where I go down and I, I save Los Angeles. I, I turn the shit heel into a hero and, and save all of Los Angeles from nuclear holocaust by taking that bomb out into the desert somehow. And... That's having its 20th year anniversary. As you mentioned, Mommy Dearest is having its 40th, but the one that's having its 30th is T2. Bada boom. And that's that, that has to be one of the great death scenes ever put on film. I'm sorry. It still looks great. You know, it's funny. You you go back and you watch movie because remember at the time, you know, I, what was it like the first time you saw that movie with finished special effects? Because those special effects were beyond state of the art for 1991. Was it just otherworldly to to watch that movie but then uh, did you see with an audience first yeah um yeah i think for some reason i'm trying to remember what the premiere was no i saw it in the premiere and then robert patrick and i were friends before that and we both went with our girlfriends to the opening night at the uh, cinerama dome oh my god we made an arrangement in advance so that we could sneak into the very back the four of us and just sit there with popcorn and watch with a crowd and yeah, but the the special effects were practical to a great extent. There's only, I understand from what I said, there's only 40 CGI e- events in that film. So that shot with the silver thing going through your mouth, that's an actual silver thing. Yeah, I had an actual silver thing for two weeks to practice sword swallowing up. Yikes. Bit uh, the back of my head to have a, a, a celastic leather sort of thing that would press up against the right up against the flat of my neck and then the off camera side of my head have a retraction pulley that would pull a blade this way to make it oh. going that way right and they had to have the blade going in my mouth far enough down my mouth i'm a guy that chokes on toothbrushes so this was a lot so like having a blade down there and then they, they wanted to split um they, they ran a tube down the back side the non-camera side of the blade with milk and blood. Right. Of course. And it would divide at the very back. And they had Stan Winston, the great Stan Winston had forgotten to take the kitchen counter into account when pinning me to the cupboard. So it's not a straight slide down. Not a straight slide down. It's I have to do a back bend for three hours while they match the glint with the blade uh, going out of the back of the head into the mouth. Uh, and then another four hours to five hours on the ground once I'd been slumped down and and uh, because I couldn't, and Jim made it clear that if you move a muscle in any of these sequences, when we call cut, you cannot move. Uh, you cannot move. If you move a muscle, it'll show up and you'll fuck the whole thing up. Uh, okay. So there I am in this little pool of milk and blood that he personally keeps swirling as it gets absorbed into my jeans. The sliding glass door is open. The cable is running to keep the whole generator thing powered up um, for the lights and the cameras. And um, it's ice cold air just coming in. And I'm just lying there slumped with my neck against the cabinet dripping blood. This show, Household Faces, by the way, has made it into my weekly must listen to list. And If the fortunes favor us, that's you and me, when I return for Epi 272 week after next, my guest will be the host, John Ross Bowie. Fingers crossed. I'll be back right after this important message. Friends at Henderson's Pants, we've noticed that adults, teens, and children are not the only ones wearing the pants in the family these days. Believe it or not, even little babies are fond of wearing a well-tailored pant now and again. But up until now, they were limited in their selection of lower body garments in that most of what is available are simply just baby pants. Baggy, shapeless, and with little to show off that fast-developing physique. 
Henderson's is proud to introduce Henderson's Toddler Trousers. These slick slacks are the kind of infant wear that can make even the most preoccupied paste eater sit up and take notice. The extra layers of material in the knee and buttock help to assure hours of comfortable crawling and soft landings for when baby goes boom. And the bit of extra given the crotch keeps your tyke from that most unsightly of sandbox no-nos, the dreaded diaper toe. Isn't it about time for Junior to crawl out in comfort and style? Henderson's toddler trousers come in a variety of luxurious fabrics, the kind found in the finest men's suits on the market today. But Henderson's serge, corduroy, and linen stock has been married with state-of-the-art polyfiber blends, which not only assure years of durable wear, but enough stretchability that today's baby will still be wearing those spiffy duds when it comes time to accept his or her diploma as your now adult offspring graduates from high school. Originally designed for use by Hollywood's little people, jockeys, and chimpanzee astronauts, Henderson's toddler trousers are now available wherever clothes for tiny little humans are sold. That's Henderson's, makers of fine trousers and pantaloons since 1896. And now, back to Succotash. Okay, message not that important after all. <laughs> Sorry for the false alarm. Next up, is this folk song that I saw get tweeted out by Patton Oswald the other day. This is the audio from a video that's up online, and I, I put a link to it on our SuccotashShow.com blog page for the episode if you want to go watch it, because it's uh, interesting to watch. The music was composed, performed, and edited by Nick Lutzko. The words? Those are pure Alex Jones, a guy who is a conspiracy theory in his own right. The paradigm of absolute control. And that's why we're just out here doing simple things, pointing out that we're meant to be in nature and be natural. And this is where we find the source that God made to transcend the new world order. And that's why they want to try to keep us out of it. I'm angry. I've had enough of these people. Little bones of Christian murder scum. Marilyn giant death factories keeping babies alive. And selling their body parts. What more do you need to know about these people? I go out and face this scum. They literally crawl out from under rocks. They have green looking skin and they run around screaming, We love Satan, we wanna eat babies. I have them on video. Hillary's in the creepy, weird, sick stuff, man. She sleeps in the same room with that creepy weirdo woman whose mother wears a hood over her head. What the hell? That woman number one is ugly. Imagine how bad she smells, man. I'm told her and Obama just stink. Obama and Hillary both smell like sulfur. Fire pot, then the goblins are hobbling round, coming after us. My spirit gets close to that evil, and I feel it go. Ah, ah, ah. We're such self centered crap, we don't even know this hand itself rising up against us. Millions of pointed people of the very worst type, and I'm so pissed. Gonna steal your daughter at the mall. Oh, oh, oh. We're gonna steal your wife, your son. Ooh. We're gonna stab you with a butcher knife. And then the police chief is gonna say, We love our Somalis. We love our Muslims. Oh, they're so good. Oh, they're so sweet. Very creative, and it really lets you see how crazy pants Alex Jones is. Thanks, Nick Lutzko. We finally got a call about the show on the Succotash and Runaway Truck Ramp status hotline, so let's give that a listen, and we can get into it. Warranties are time-sensitive. They must be extended before your vehicle reaches a certain mileage. Don't make the costly mistake in driving your vehicle without it. Press 1 now to speak to a warranty specialist and ask about our 0% financing. 
press 3 to close your warranty coverage and stop these courtesy calls. Assholes. How did they get this number? Oh, right. 818-921-7212. We put it out at the end of every show. And now here's yours truly from when I was heading back up Interstate Highway 5 from Los Angeles on Sunday, recording my observations as I was nearing the northbound runaway truck ramp on the grapevine. Hi, it's Mark Hershon, co-host of Succotash, the comedy Soundcast Soundcast, and I am giving my very own runaway truck ramp up. I am heading northbound on Interstate 5 over what's commonly called the Grapevine. As, as I am approaching the off-ramp, uh, there is a big rig being put on a tow truck, but this is in advance of the actual runaway truck ramp, so uh, it's not availed itself of that ability to stop itself. And as I round the curve here, uh, Scoot around the side of another big rig, which seems to be in perfect control. I can see the runaway truck ramp looming large in front of me. Uh, almost sympathetically, I apply my brakes uh, to slow just a bit. Uh, the exit's coming up now. Uh, it's a beautiful stretch of well groomed gravel uh, that rolls up the hill to a essentially a dead-end stop, so the truck was truly run away. Uh, this ramp is designed to stop it in its tracks. Uh, I have to say, the ramp here looks all clear. Back to me. It turns out, by the way, that southbound there is no runaway truck ramp, just a brake check area, which I saw on the way to Los Angeles the week before. Unlike the runaway truck ramp, this area was choked with weeds and debris and was shockingly run down. I, I wouldn't check my brakes there if you paid me. Before I slip out of here, we got to open that tweet sack and acknowledge the guys and gals who've taken the time to mention at Succotash Show, or at least like our shit, on socials. Here we go. Zach Kahn, Dennis Carlin, Rick Overton, Guitar Suncat. Astasia Schloss Jones, Misfit Scully, Laura Sainer, Andy Kindler, Jock Doc Podcast, Corey Epps, Hunter Block, Fascination Street, Chris Mancini, Married Crazy Pod and Vlog, Salty Language Pod, Gluten Free Gaming Podcast, Joe Magaha, Miu, that sounds like a cat, Miu. Carol and Trolley a uh, Daryl Dale. Phil Lairness. Let's Chat Podcast. Jordan Brady, David Lee, Adele Blah, and the Judges Pod. That's going to do it for this episode of Succotash Epi 270. Stick around next week in this very same feed for Tyson Saner in episode 271. He's going to have a whole passel of clips for you. And who knows, he may have some other surprises. Last week he had an interview. So things keep changing here and it's all good. Uh, we will have a minute of silence following uh, our announcer Bill Haywatt's exit. In honor of uh, Norm MacDonald, we'll put uh, a mute on the stand-up mic for a minute. And uh, in the meantime, till we see you next time, uh, don't forget to uh, wash your hands, wear a mask, get your damn vaccination if you hadn't, uh, get a booster if you're if you're allowed to, if you're if if your time's up to get that. And uh, remember, if anyone asks you if you heard anything good lately, won't you please pass the succotash? You've been listening to Succotash, the comedy soundcast soundcast with your host, Mark Hershaw. Brought to you by Henderson's Pants and... Imagine your company's name right here. Rate us and review us at Apple and Google Podcasts. Find us on the web at SuccotashShow.com. On Spotify. On Stitcher. On iHeartRadio. On YouTube. On SoundCloud. And wherever fine soundcasts are streamed and or downloaded. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Succotash Show. Like us on Facebook 
email us at marc at succotashshow.com or call into the Succotash Skype line at our toll call number 818-921-7212. number again is 818-921-7212. You can also upload clips from your favorite comedy soundcasts directly to us using our direct upload link at hightail.com slash you slash Succotash. Succotash is produced and engineered by Joe Paulino through the auspices of Studio P. Sausalito, the home of the hit. Our hosts are Mark Hershon and Tyson Sainer. Our musical director is Scott Carvey. Our booth assistant is Kenny Durges. Succotash is executive produced by Mark Hershon. Until next time, I'm your loyal booth announcer, Bill Haywatt, reminding you to please pass the Succotash goodbye. This has been a Succotash Patch production.